My name is Kip. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be talking about real-time machine learning. A little bit about my background. So I actually come from a very non-technical background. I had published a few non-technical books before I went to college and became an engineer. I have done machine learning at a, a several startups and big companies such as Netflix and NVIDIA. Um, so currently I am working on my own project on real-time machine learning. And also I'm also writing a book for O'Reilly. As a motivation for this talk, I just want to mention TikTok. I could assume that a lot of you have already heard of it or have an account on it. Um, I never got a hang with it, but it's amazing. So TikTok is one of the, one of the biggest social phenomenon in the last few years. So it totally eclipsed what came before it, like Vine or Snapchat. And one of the objectives I kept hearing people say when they mentioned TikTok is that it, it is extremely, extremely addictive. So like, um, and there are many reasons to explain why TikTok is so addictive. And I would say one of the reasons is their technologies. So TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, has been able to build a really, really incredible in infrastructure that allows them to do on online real-time machine learning, to, to allow them to learn users' preference very quickly. So if you download a TikTok, you can just like spend a few minutes scrolling through a few videos and they can learn exactly what you like and they recommend to you like, what videos you will most likely to watch next, giving you a really, really great um, user experience. Happy news all of really. In, in my talk today, um, so I'm gonna cover two levels of real-time machine learning. The first is online predictions and the second is online, learn, online learning. Before we go ahead, I just want to uh, go over the definitions of real-time. So real-time is, um, is this kind of ambiguous term and um, I think people might want to argue, whenever I bring up real-time machine learning, people always ask me, what do you mean by real-time? So you talk to philosopher and recently like quantum physics, physicists, they might say something like, there's no such thing as time. And if you talk to software engineers, they will say something like, there's no such thing as real-time. Like, no matter how fast the systems are doing things, there's always some delay, whether it can be like milliseconds to like even in nanoseconds, but there's a delay. So, uh, so what, what real time means is different for different type of systems. So for online predictions, real time is defined to be like, uh, in my definitions, is defined to be between milliseconds to like two seconds. Whereas uh, when you do online learning, real time means like in order of minutes. So I'm so like, I just want to go over like what, what it means to be like a model versus system because I say system a lot. So model here means machine learning model, whereas systems means the entire system, including the interface, data, compute infrastructure. So let's go first to the first level is the online predictions. Um, if you have built any kind of system for users, you probably know that like latency matters a lot. There have been many research done to um, to highlight the importance of, uh, of latency. And here's two of my favorite research um, studies. One is by Google. Google, even back in 2009, they found out if you, if you increase latencies from like 100 to 400 milliseconds, you can reduce searches by like 0.2%, 0.6% for users. And booking.com is a, is a more recent study. And it says found that if you increase the latency in like 30, uh, by 30%, you can uh, reduce um, conversion rate by 0.5%. And because conversion rate is directly tied to a revenue, my 0.5% conversion rate means a lot in terms of financial uh, consequences. So no matter how great some machine learning model are, if it takes just milliseconds too long, users are going to click on something else. A trend with machine learning in the last few years is that we are embracing the as a bigger, better, um, better approach. So I, I remember that back then we we're talking about like we can build like a model with a million parameters, and it was like whoa, that's crazy. And then we had like a billion, a model with a billion parameters, and and now we are talking about models with a trillion of parameters. So we have seen that um, as models get bigger, their performance, so they they will achieve better performance. But a cost of that is that like they tend to so take longer to make inference. So um, so when when models like BERT or GPT first came out, a lot of people worry that this model is going to be too slow to be useful. So imagine if you want to uh, predict what is on the time on the phone, and if the time it takes for, uh, for, this, for the model to predict the next character take, is longer than the time it takes for users to actually type the character, that model is not going to be very useful. 
So one, one time, so one way to get around this is that like, just don't do online predictions. So it's like when users enter a query, you just don't predict, make prediction based of query right away. But instead you try to generate, generate all the predictions beforehand. So if you don't do online predictions, there can be no prediction latency. So one up, um, um, so 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 if you don't do online predictions, what can you do? So one up, one approach is doing batch predictions. Is that you generate all the predictions before uh, or offline in batch, and you store them somewhere such as in a SQL table, and you only print out pre-computed predictions when needed. So batch predictions have been very successful, and a lot of companies are still using it. For example, Netflix. Netflix is definitely very famous for their recommendation systems. So when you open the Netflix homepage, you will see a lot of recommended movies to you. And these recommend recommendations are not generated as you open the web page. They're actually pre-computed somewhere. And only when you opened uh, the, the, the Netflix website that you can see this recommendation because they're gonna be fetched from there somewhere in storage somewhere. So if you try to refresh the uh, so Netflix, you will see that you know, even though the roles might, the order of the roles might change, the actual movie recommendations don't change. So there are like a lot of problems with uh, with batch predictions. I mean, yes, they are great, but they have like have certain drawbacks. One is that uh, you need to know exactly how many predictions you generate beforehand. So it means that you need to have a finite input space. So in the case of Netflix, Netflix know exactly how many users are there. And you just like need to pre-compute on the recommendations for, for these users. If there's a new users coming, they can just give them some generic recommendations, such as uh, an average or like just some most popular movies. So another problem with batch predictions is that it, uh, they can't adapt to changing interest, right? So for example, you have been using Netflix and you've been watching a lot of horror movies. So the recommendations are gonna include, uh, are going to include a lot of, re of recommendations for horror, mo horror movie. But then you're feeling very happy today. So you want to watch like comedy. So you're gonna look into like comedy uh, category, you wanna search for comedy movies. So you would, you would have image, you would think that Netflix would be able to like change the predictions, uh, recommendation to show you more more uh, comedy movies, but actually Netflix can't. And it can only like update the recommendations for you the next time you open, uh, the next time Netflix generates uh, the next batch of, of recommendations. Some of, of four companies, a lot of them try to like, adapt to this by forcing the input space to be finite. So first of all, like chip advisors, um, when you open chip advisors, they first let you make you choose a, a city, for example, San Francisco or New York and choose a category like in a hotel or restaurants that can show you like good recommendations. But if you try to enter some wide queries such as like high rating Thai restaurants in Hayes Valley, so reach the result you, you receive is not gonna be very good. Online predictions can help you overcome these drawbacks. And also online predictions can allow you to use dynamic features. So what are dynamic features? Static features are features that don't change or don't change very often, such as the like age, gender, neighborhood, job, income. Whereas dynamic features are those that can change like very quickly. For example, like what am I reading right now? What am I watching right now? Because you can imagine just what am I reading or watching right now is very important to predict what I want to watch or read next. Um, Online predictions, so to be able to do things, um, to do online predictions, you will need uh, several things. The first is that you need fast inference, a model that can make predictions in the order of milliseconds. The second thing you need is a real-time pipeline, that a pipeline that can process data and put into model and return prediction in real time. So the first, like for fast inference, there are like many ways, but there are three main ways to make it happen. So much, so first is to make models faster. Second, it should make models smaller. And the third is to make hardware more powerful. To make models faster, there have been many exciting approaches. And here are two of my favorite solutions I have seen as come across. So to make a model faster, you can um, you can do things for us like you can fuse operation together, or you can like write specific kernels like to do certain kind of operations. You can do dynamic tensor memory. Uh, you can so like compile a model to like optimize the executions on certain hardware. So here's some of my two favorite solutions. Is one is Apache TBM and another is TensorRT. I feel free to check them out. They're really awesome. 
to make models smaller, also known as model compression, say like many different approach. So one, um, so the most popular approach is pre-quantization. It's like to reduce the precision of the model. Precision is not like precision as in precision accuracy, but precision as in as the number of bits that you need to store a, a number. So usually if you want to store a float is 32 bit. So if you reduce the precision by half, then only store, you don't need like 16 bit. A lot of companies probably using um, integer inference. So they, they really store weight in integer, which really takes up eight bits. Um, another approach is knowledge distillations. It's also known as like student diction network. So you have a big model that does something really well. And then you want to train a smaller model to mimic the, um, the behavior of this big model. Also pruning is when you try to like set on the weight, um, on, the, uh, on the weight or activation to that's not very useful to zero and so low factorization but you have a very large matrix you want to reduce a demand so you, you want to factorize this very large matrix into a lower ranked uh, matrices um i think this is really interesting and when i just look into like what, what kind of model compression solutions are there and this is how like 42 model compression open source projects um i think they have, have been more more have been coming out since then um, if you're interested in um, in how to make models like smaller, faster, I highly recommend you check out this blog post by Rob Block. So they, by using different techniques for model compressions and inference of my optimizations, they were able to improve their, their, um, their latency by like 30, 30 times. Um, another approach uh, to, to make fast inference is just to make hardware make hardware more powerful so you can do inference of this hardware faster and there have been uh, many different hardware startups focusing on like both training and inference on both uh, like cloud and on device um, hardware and this I think it's just a list of a few startups that have raised money recently and you can see that they spread out all over the world and they have raised a lot of money the next part uh, to allow for online predictions is that a real-time pipeline and just to highlight what a time pipeline is, I'm going to use a ride sharing example. So imagine you're trying to predict whether uh, a transaction is fraught with a ride sharing uh, system such as Uber. You, you might need uh, features from various aspects such as like you, want, like, you, want, you want to know about the specific transactions. You want to know about users' recent transactions, for example, over the last seven days. You want to know about this credit card recent transactions. For example, like if this credit card had been uh, added like just uh, was added only two days ago I have seen like 20 different transactions and maybe it's a, it's a red flag you also like want to like use like see look at the recent enough frauds because maybe it's a bit a new way of like committing fraud and maybe this is related to this somehow so so you want to do use a lot of you want to use a lot of reasons uh re recent features and the question is this question here is that how do we quickly assess these features because you don't want to put those features in, in some permanent storage like S3 because like each time you need to pull out these features, it's, it's too slow. And you want to detect the fraud, the fraud as soon as possible. So one, one way to do it is just to store all those the recent uh, features into memory. So every time something happens, like every time users does something in app, for example, like fix the locations, book a trip, um, you can uh, like add a credit card, a contact driver, or cancel a trip, you, you, you want to store one of them into memory. So for all of the event, after like seven days, uh, or you can say like, like seven days or 10 days, it's up, it's up to you. Um, you know, when, it's, when these events are no longer useful, you can either discard them or, or move them to permanent storage or S3. And this is exactly what a stream storage is. So um, the most popular solutions is probably Apache Kafka and Amazon also has a very popular solution. It's called Amazon Kinesis. And if you look or go on uh, Stack Share, you can see like hundreds of companies are using these solutions. Um, so so, so um, when you want to do online predictions, you need not just um, static features, so you need both static features and dynamic features. So static features come from like static data, so you can have data in something like uh, CSV or Packet. Packet is a really exciting um, data format uh, that, I, uh, that I always recommend um, companies I work with to use. So, so for static data, you, it's usually about it, so you know when a job finishes. Uh, but, but with streaming data, you, you just like don't know when it um when it finished it might it might never finish so for um so for for static data you can uh, you can process them in batch so using something like sql or map reduce uh whereas like for stream data you, you want to process them as as soon as they arrive so you, you want to use tools such as like apache fling or samza 
So, so you can so uh, in um, a, a lot of people like uh, both in academia and in the industry, when you train a model, you usually use train model using static data. So, um, so whereas when you do inference, you usually do inference on streaming data. So you can see that like there are only two pipi. So you have one machine learning model, but like two two pipi. So for training, you have static data, you go batch processing and you attract features and you input into the model. And in, in doing inference, you have streaming data, you go through stream processing, you attract features and you you, know, you input the feature into machine learning model. So there's actually a very common source of errors in, pro in productions. And it's especially common when these two different pipelines are maintained by different teams. So in math, for example, the training uh, pipeline is maintained by the machining machine team, whereas the inference pipeline is maintained by the De DevOps team. It, it seems like, uh, it, seems like uh, it might seem like an overfetching example, but actually um, pretty common. So here's an example of, of Weibo. So before they actually have two completely different pipelines. For um, for training and inference, they call it offline pipeline and online pipeline. So um, Weibo actually spent a lot of effort into unifying this pipeline using Apache Flink. Um, so you can see like uh, on the top is a previous pipeline, um, and now they have like unified pipeline. And it's not just Weibo. We have seen that in companies like um, Uber, uh, Alibaba, or Lyft. So, so um, if you try to talk about like stream processing, you, you kind of want to talk about my, microservices as well. So you, you must have heard about microservices. It has taken the world by storm the last decade. And going hand in hand with microservices, usually REST API. Uh, if, you, if, if REST API like, doesn't mean anything to you, don't, don't worry yet, we're gonna go over it very quickly. So for REST API, uh, uh, usually the REST API is, is request driven. So it means what it means is that you have a client and a server. And the client sent a request via something like post get to the server and server is gonna return a response. So server has to listen for the request to register. So if for some reason the survey is down, then the client has to keep on pinging the server until it gets a response back or it can have something time out and it doesn't work anymore. So uh, it can get like, really complicated. So imagine you have an, um, so imagine you have a right string service again and you have like a three different service services. One is rider management is um uh, and another is driver management and price optimizations. So rider management need to uh need to ping the driver management to get like uh understand driver ability uh driver availability and ping the price optimization to to get the price to show riders. And so the driver management needs to ping the rider management and price optimizations so that they can tell like how how many Drivers, they should multiple mobilize or what surcharge they can give um, you know, give drivers so they can encourage them to get on the street if they're like an overwhelming demand for rides right now. And similar with price optimizations, we need to link both uh, rider and driver to get um to get information. So in terms of service communication, can get really complicated and can make it very slow with the data transferring back and forth. Um, so another problem with like with request driven is that because like each each microservice ma like manages their own their own thing, um, is there no way you can or it's very very, very it's going to be very difficult to map the data transformation through the entire system to get a good pictures of like what's going on, um, or like uh, it's going to be very hard to debug like if something is down with price optimization, you need to go back into rider management and and driver management to get a good picture of what happened and what causes. So uh, instead of doing this like uh, request driven model, uh, what, what if like, what if uh, instead of like different services, microservices pinging each other, what if we have like all the microservices to like publish something to a stream and whoever wants information from that service can just like subscribe to the stream and get the information. So now you, instead of having this mess of like inter-service communications, now everyone might publish and subscribe to a same stream. And gets in and publish information they want and just get information they want from the stream stream. So because now we have like data flow through this stream, so you can actually build a dashboard to monitor data tr transformation through the entire system. Um, and this model is called uh, PubSub, short for uh, publish and subscribe. But there are also other systems for for event driven um, approach as well. A lot of companies have been doing stream processing, but also a lot of companies are not doing stream processing. And um, there are like a lot of reasons. One reason is that companies don't see the benefits of streaming. 
So maybe it's our system. The system is not as a scale where inter-service communications is a problem. And so you, you don't have to switch to the event-driven um, uh, model. Um, or like the best predictions have been working just fine. And also because you have never done online predictions before. So maybe online predictions can help give you improvement, but because you have never done it before, you, you don't know that they will, and therefore you're not motivated to like change our infrastructure to do that. Um, also, like to switch from like um, batch processing to stream processing can require high initial investment on infrastructure, which a lot of companies are not willing to do, especially when they can't see the added benefits yet. Um, it also like require mental shift from doing batch processing to stream processing. So um, like well, if you used to do things like in a, in a um, in static data, it's, it's my very hard to like work with it as it will never terminate. And also like uh, a lot of tools in a, in a, in streaming processing right now is is uh, Java based, and a lot of people working with machine learning is like very comparable with Python. So you need to switch to uh, using stream processing. It can, you you will need to like work with tools that you're not familiar with, and of course there are tools that like let you handle things in a in Python, but it can be like, pretty awkward to use. And for the next part, uh, it's a uh, next level of uh, real-time machine learning is online learning, so like, something I'm pretty excited about. So to begin, like online learning is different from online training. So online training is you can learn from each incoming data point, and it has a lot of, uh, uh, it's very difficult to do because it's, it can suffer from catastrophic forgetting. I talked to several companies, they have tried doing it and none of it ever worked. Um, and it can get very, very expensive because like imagine you have some hardware that can that is capable of doing um, computations on like a lot of samples at the same time. So if you use that hardware to make the computation on only one sample, that can get very, very expensive and wasteful. So the companies that have seen that doing online learning are uh, successful in, in practice, they do the learn in micro batches. So instead of learning with every incoming sample, they, they learn with every coming like uh, 500 or 1000 of samples. With online learning, one, one challenge it was it was evaluations right so so the first step we want to do is want to do offline evaluations so that you want to evaluate the models on some static data to make sure that it's not doing something crazy and like ruin everything um, but the point of online learning is that you can adapt adapt the model into uh, changing interest changing uh, changing ver uh, changing environment so it doesn't make sense to test the uh, to test the the model on something that is non-changing in invari variable. So, so the only way for you to really test the model is to like fan it out to different users and see how they behave. So the popular system is A-B testing. And it's just, uh, so A-B testing here is make it sound very simple as you just need to compare like system A and system B, whereas uh, you actually have to compare like many, many, many different versions of your system. So um, actually it's just totally a startup idea. You can build a very a system to help companies do Complicate, uh, complex A-B testing um, with online learning. Many companies say, um, also online learning that doesn't mean that you don't do offline learning. Many companies do online learning in tandem with offline learning so that it can produce a more stable system. So in traditional offline learning, the so iteration cycle can take up to like months, uh, some companies can be really fast and in weeks. But um, when you do online learning, a uh, Weibo is, uh, for companies like Weibo, they can do it in uh, in 10 minutes iterations. So you can like attract new features, uh, you can train models, and then you can uh, deploy the model within like within minutes. And it's been a really impressive. We have so heard similar number from other companies in China as well. There's a different use cases for online learning. And the most popular use case right now is for recommendation systems. So the reason is that like recommendation systems uh, problems have natural labels. So if you give users a lot of, of recommendations, um, you, you, you can just observe how users react to these recommendations and get the label from it. So like if user click on a recommendation, they know that it's a good prediction. If, it, if they don't click on it, they will look on it, it's, it's probably not a good um, recommendations. Um, I also like just want to like clarify that not all recommendation systems need online learning because there are many systems that like um, uh, many many systems that have very slow to change references. For example, like users' preference for houses, cars, flights, hotels are unlikely to change uh, very quickly. Whereas like users' preference for things like online content such as like videos, article, tweets, memes, they can change very quickly from second to seconds and 
for this kind of um, systems that have like quick to change preferences, you want to learn those preferences very quickly. So online learning is going to be very important for this kind of system. There are other use cases for online learning. So one, one use case is for rare events. So imagine um, um, imagine you have something, some, some, some events that like rarely occur, such as um, Black Friday for shopping. So Black Friday happens only once a year. It's really impossible for, uh, for you to get enough historical data to predict what users are gonna do this year. To be really effective, you, 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 you want to learn on the fly on that day, on Black Friday, like just from like the beginning um, to see what users are gonna behave, uh, what users are gonna do next. Um, also, like it can help you avoid the cold start problem. So imagine you ship an app to a users because uh, it's, it's a new user. You, you don't have any data on, on that user to like predict what they like. So if, if you don't do online learning and you do offline learning, you have to wait until the next time models is trained and deployed so that you, you can like produce like relevant recommendations for that user. But like if you do online learning, then you can just like wait for users to like spend a few minutes um, on, on the on the on the app and you can like get users to um, get, get can show users very relevant predictions like TikTok does. Um, and online learning is actually a very different, uh, it's also like a very different mindset from offline learning. So if when you start looking into online learning, a lot of things that you know about offline learning are no longer true. So in school, I was taught that like offline machine learning is to train the model with sufficient number of, of epochs until conversions and evaluate on a static test set, right? Um, in online learning, there's like no such thing as epoch because you've seen each data by at most once. There's no conversions because like the data is like constantly shifting, you have no idea what what the model should be converging to. And also there's no static test test, you have to do like online testing, like A-B testing. So actually when I was looking into real-time machine learning, I was actually very surprised because uh, a, a lot of great examples I found actually from China and I haven't heard of this before. So I post this thing on like link on social media, I know uh, social media is not, it's not like legitimate evidence, but I think I saw some really, really interesting uh, observation from people who have been working with both Chinese and American company and they have own, and, and they, some of them has told me that they have, have observed the same thing as well. So if you have seen something similar, I would love to hear. So when we talk about the, um, the AI race between US and China, a lot of people have been like citing things like the number of papers, the citations, but also there's another very interesting metric is the adoption rate. So if you look at like firms that are adopting AI and firms that are piloting AI, you can see that actually the number is a lot higher in China than in the US. So it seems like this uh, the AI adoption in China is more mature and maybe it's heavily, maybe that's why they can build better infrastructure. There's also other reasons. Um, so like some, somebody told me that, um, I know a lot of this is like very hand with there's no scientific research behind it. So like a lot of this is anecdotal evidence. So please take it with a grain of salt. I would love to hear your feedback as well. So someone told me uh, that like, it looked like a lot of internet companies in the US are like old. Um, and yes, they're like they're decades ahead of, um, of Chinese companies. And one thing that come with that is that they have more legacy infrastructure. So like, every time they want to change the way they do things, they need to update the, the infrastructure is very expensive. Whereas in Chinese companies, they can just like build things from scratch and it makes it easier for them to adopt a new way of doing things. And also it seems like there's a more national effort uh, from China than um, in, in China than in the US. So I'm actually working on something related to uh, machine learning. So if you want to discuss more about it, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you.